Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we want to read verses 1 to 7. So please stand as we read God's Word. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money. He must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church, so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. You may now take your seat. This is God's word. And the title of our study is Biblical Eldership Part 4. We're studying this crucial subject as we plant our church. And our studies are related to that purpose. And there's reason why uh, we're exploring the Gospel of John. Because the Gospel of John is evangelistic in its nature. And as we plant our church, we want to be evangelistic in our mindset. Witnessing. To the community. We're also studying the book of Acts to help us understand uh, the principles we need to apply as we plant the church. And now in our short break, we want to look at the topic of spiritual leadership. And I want to remind you of our three objectives of studying this. And the first one is, of course, the obvious one. We need to have the right understanding of overseer. What is an overseer? What is a pastor? Second, to prepare us when the Lord grant us one, when we need one, we need to be prepared for that. And third, to strengthen our structure. We do understand that there are uh, five components of uh, foundation of the church, the structure, the high view of God, or the high view of scripture, sound doctrine, God the living, and spiritual leadership. And so we, we want to have those five structures ready. And, and biblical eldership is very crucial because it is part of the structure. To equip our minds, we want to study this, to prepare us and strengthen our structure. And I pray that you and I will take this seriously and be committed to this important doctrine. And so what we did is we divided 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 7 into two sections. Verse 1 is the calling of a spiritual leader. The calling of a spiritual leader. In verses 2 to 7 is the credentials of the spiritual leader. And in the calling of the spiritual leader, we have five aspects, right? If you remember, we have five aspects of the call. We said last time that the calling of overseer is a serious call. It says there it is a trustworthy statement. It is very important. The life of the church depends on its leaders. Hosea said like people like what? Like people like priests. Paul said follow me as I follow Christ. And so weak and superficial shallow leader produces weak superficial, shallow congregation. The worldly church wants worldly leaders. And so this is a serious call. The call of a pastor is a serious call. Second, we, we look at the specific call, that spiritual leadership is a specific call. And what is that? Meaning, the office of a pastor is for who? Man only. 
In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, Paul said, A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. And then he said in verse 12, But I do not allow women to teach or exercise authority over men, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. This is a specific call. And so a church that has a, a woman as a pastor is a weak church, unbiblical church. And we need to be reminded about that. Third thing is, Spiritual leadership is a shepherding call. It is a serious call. It is a specific call. It is a shepherding call to feed the flock, to protect the flock, and to preserve the flock. To feed meaning, to preach and teach God's word. To protect meaning, to protect the church from false teaching, false ideas philosophies that are inconsistent with God's Word. And we have a lot of that in our culture, true? And we need to be protected. Third is to preserve, meaning to be an example of godliness. And then last week, we talked about this, the sacrificial call, that spiritual leadership is a sacrificial call, meaning it is a hard work, Dedication and devotion to study God's Word, to work hard in personal sanctification, to labor and strive to serve the people of God. It is a hard work. And today we want to look at the fifth and last aspect. We're still in verse 1. Spiritual leadership is a sincere call. It is a sincere call. This is very important, very crucial because, look, aspiration and hard work without sincerity is what? Futile, vain, right? Hard work, aspiration without sincerity is meaningless. Richard Baxter, in his book, The Reformed Pastor, he said, their own sincerity in the faith is the condition of their glory. He said, simply considered, though their great ministerial labors may be a condition of the promise of their greater glory. Many have warned others that they come not to that place of torment, while yet they, meaning the pastor, hasten to it themselves. Many a preacher is now in hell. He said, who had a hundred times called upon his hearers to use the utmost care and diligence to escape it. Can any reasonable man imagine that God should save men for offering salvation to others? And listen, while they, the pastor, refuse it themselves and for telling others those truths which they, the pastor, themselves neglect and abuse. Close quote. This is a very thoughtful reminder to myself. Richard Baxter does a really good job of making pastors sit up straight. After all, the Lord Jesus is more interested in the pastor's what? Sincerity, right? He is interested in the pastor's sincerity. He wants the heart. He wants your heart. Meaning you worship him with your lips, but if your heart is far away from him, it is in vain, true? Even if you work hard in singing, even if you work hard in reading the scripture, but if our heart is far away from God, those things are meaningless. That's why Jesus asked Peter three times, what? Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? Because the love of Christ is what makes Peter different from who? 
Judas. His love for Christ makes him different, meaning Peter, different from Judas. Well, Judas had the privilege of being part of the Twelve, trained by the greatest theologian who lived on earth. He worked hard with Jesus, performing many signs and wonders with Christ. He traveled with Christ, experienced uh, popularity. He experienced persecution. He tasted grace and truth in its fullness. And then yet what happened? He bailed out. Deserted Christ. Departed from, from the faith. D disqualified from the service. Why? Because he's not sincere. No love for Christ. No devotion. No sincerity for Christ. I think the Lord Jesus has only one, um, only one ordination question. If you remember, did the pastor have, in, in his ordination, has, have to answer a lot of ordination theological questions, right? But Jesus only have one ordination question. And what is that? Do you love me more than this? Only God can make a man for himself. Only God can produce sincerity in a man. And then he said to Peter, feed my flock. Tend my sheep. And today we want to look at the sincere call. Two words I want you to remember. First is desire. Look at verse 1 again. The word desire. Now, the second word that I want you to remember is the word danger. It's not there, but we want to talk about the danger. Let's read again verse 1. It is a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work. And there's the word he desires to do. Desire. Last time we said that the word aspire and desire were different. If you're using King James Version, um, Paul uses desire twice. But if you're using um, NASB, you can see the word aspire and the word desire. So those are different words. Uh, the word aspire focuses on the outward compulsion, external. The word means to stretch oneself forward to grass. So just imagine a man wants to reach something. It is an outward compulsion. It is a spirit-given compulsion. He is a man of ambition. He has a goal. He has a mission. And he prepares his way towards that goal. In the church, you can observe that. The church, you can see that. You can recognize a man who aspires to the office. Why? Because he volunteers. He does the work of the, of the ministry. And you can see that person. He wants to be a pastor. So that's the first word, aspire. On the other hand, the word desire, you can see there it is a fine work he desires to do. That word is an internal compulsion, a passionate desire. A personal desire, a very strong desire, earnest desire, a coveting kind of desire. You know, to the point that he lost over that office. That's the word desire there. A man who lost the work of a pastor, very strong desire. Of course, in this context, it is for good rather than evil. It is a passionate Compulsion, inward compulsion. And this is what drives the man of God to serve his church. There must be an outward and inward compulsion. Aspire and desire, craving the work of a pastor. John MacArthur said, quote, For him, the ministry is not the best option. It is the only option. There is nothing else he could do with his life that would fulfill him. Close quote. Very strong desire. I guess this is more challenging for a man that is 
versatile and gifted, a man that has, can, can do many things. It will be a challenge for him because he needs to discriminately choose the ministry against all things he knows to do that can provide him uh, more advantages in life in terms of finances and resources uh, to provide for his family. It will be a tough decision for him. But a sincere man will surely love the ministry more than anything else. If you, if you know Martin Lloyd-Jones, he's a medical doctor, a promising career, leaving his high-paying job to serve the Lord Jesus as a pastor. Very sincere man. There must be a spirit-given, passionate desire to do that, right? A burning commitment and dedication to the ministry. And that's why Paul said to Timothy, if you want to turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15, he said to Timothy, take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. In other words, a pastor cannot have a double agenda in life. Double-minded. He cannot be double-minded. He cannot have double agendas in life that can drain his energy, that can distract him. Yes, there are situations in which he finds himself doing bivocational work. Time can be limited and the work can be draining. Uh, progress can be slow. But whatever the case, his second job must only support the Lord's work and not a competition. Do you understand that? A pastor can be bivocational, but a second job only supports the Lord's work. There's no competition. He cannot be a pastor and build a career on the other side. There must be a single agenda. Paul said it is a fine work he desires to do. William Barclay said, it is not the man who glorifies the work, but the work which glorifies the man. And then he said, there is no dignity like the dignity of a great task. The Lord's work. That's what he desires. It is the work of a shepherd that he desires to do. It is a single-minded devotion to the ministry. And listen, only God can generate this desire. Only God can cause this desire, only God can make someone sincere. Even to yourself, only God can make you sincere. And I believe there are three effects in the life of a man that has this God-given compulsion. Three effects. If a man has this desire, God-given compulsion, there are three effects. Number one, vision. Turn your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Of course, Nehemiah is not a pastor, but he is a man of God that has a vision, a burning desire to serve the Lord. And in chapter 1, Nehemiah, we see him praying in chapter 1. We just want to browse Nehemiah chapter 1. We see there he is praying, he is seeking, he is mourning, Fasting, beseeching, acknowledging the loving kindness of God, His goodness and faithfulness. He also said there, He is acknowledging their sin, asking for forgiveness, and asking God to remember them. And that's where vision begins. Vision begins by knowing God, His faithfulness, His kindness, Knowing God that He will give the desires of our hearts, that He is for us, He is not against us, and then admitting that it's our fault, it is our sin that places us in a dire situation, and then we cling to His promise that God will remember us. That's where vision begins. Why did I say that? Because if you turn to chapter 2, 
you can see Nehemiah speaking with the king. There is a God-given compulsion to Nehemiah to serve the Lord. And in chapter 2, you can see there in verse 2, So the king said to me, Why is your face sad though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad? What is this here, man? He said, when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies desolate, and its gates have been consumed by fire. Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to God of heaven. I said to the king, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah. That's a sincere man. He said, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. That's the vision. That I may rebuild it. A sincere man is not about his personal interest. He is concerned not for himself. He's in a good place. He's with the king. He is safe. He is protected. He has a good position, a cupbearer. And then yet he is concerned to other people, the city. And he has this vision to rebuild it. To go to Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. And to be specific, to build what? The walls, right? He built the walls, Nehemiah. And so the same pattern we see in the ministry. God will use a man with a vision for the future. Aspiring, desiring the work of a pastor who prepares himself and proves himself faithful and capable of serving. And so this God-given desire to a pastor, the effect of that is first is he has a vision. He has a plan. Now second, commitment. This means that a pastor cannot follow what God commanded him to do without investing his life in the church. This also means that a pastor must be committed to present service. Committed to present service. Quoting again MacArthur, he said, There are plenty of believers dreaming what they might do, he said. But a far fewer saints simply doing what they should do. Are you like that? Believer, dreaming, just planning, dreaming uh, what they might do, what you can do. But there are others, few saints. They just simply do what they need to do. And then he said, there are some people who get so picky about what door they go through that they miss the opportunities God puts before them. They wait around for something wonderful to happen, but it never does because they've not shown a willingness to go through a divinely prepared and open door awaiting them. And then he said, seminary students will often specify the exact type of ministry situation they want to work in. Men expect to find a perfect church. And then he said, meanwhile, there's an open door at a church with all kinds of problem. And then he said, but they don't pursue it because it doesn't fit their exact expectations. If a door is open now, you should seriously consider entering it. Rather than sitting around waiting for something better. Close quote. What he's describing here is a man who lacks commitment. Because he lacks sincerity. They want a big church. They want a famous church. Well organized church. Church that has, that has anything. So they can sit pretty and talk about theology. Somehow they're seminary degree, their master's degree, somehow gave them a license to be picky and choosy. That man, church, is useless. Not fit for the ministry. 
You see, the principle is easy. In Luke chapter 16, verse 10, Jesus said, He who is faithful in in a very little things is also faithful in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Commitment. Those who are serious are committed. Now, third effect is he is sure of his calling. He has a vision. If he is truly sincere, he is committed. Third, very important, he is sure of his calling. Very sure of his calling. Vision is futile if a pastor is not sure of his calling. Present service is also in vain if he's not sure of his calling. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Paul said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, verse 14, he said, Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on hands by the presbytery. There are people who desire ministry and bail out because they weren't called in the first place. They're not sure of their calling. However, like here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, some are truly called but neglected. They bail out because of neglect um, or, or defection. And here Paul is telling Timothy to not neglect. And I think Paul said this to Timothy because he's starting to neglect. He is thinking of neglecting. He is thinking about leaving. He is close to departing. He is giving up on the pressure inside and outside of the church. And so Paul has to admonish him to press forward. And not bail out. One Bible teacher said, There are many people in the ministry who serve for a while, but quickly fade away. They're like shooting stars or short candles. And then he said, But I'm in awe of those who are faithful to the minister, to minister the word of God all the way to the end of their lives. And then he said, I call them spiritual ministers. Or spiritual marathon ministers. They may have small congregations, he said. They may be unknown, but they remain faithful and fulfill their calling. In a spiritual sense, he said, they die with their boots on. Close quote. It's hard to discourage a pastor who is sure of his calling. And if any man truly desires the ministry, he will have a vision, a clear plan, a clear goal. He is committed to present service. He is faithful uh, to little things, and he is sure of his calling. If any man aspires to the office of overseer, it is a fine work he desires to do. Are you praying? Church, are you praying? righteous desires for your pastors are you praying for that we need to ask god to raise men with a single minded agenda sincere love for christ in his church we need to pray for that if we truly love the church we want a pastor who is truly sincere for the work Now, second, we want to talk about the danger. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Acts 20. Beginning in verse 25. Paul said, Acts 20 verse 25, And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Verse 27, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Why? Because he is sincere. 
Now verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. There's a word. To shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And then he said in verse 29, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. There's the warning. There's a danger. Verse 31, therefore be on alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. What a sincere man. And now I command, I command you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And then He said, I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothes. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me in everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of our Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In these verses, we can observe Paul's commitment to the ministry. He said in verse 27, For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. He is committed. He served the Ephesian church for three years. He mentioned that in verse 31, preaching and teaching the whole counsel of God. And in verse 31, verses 31 to 35, we can see Paul's sincerity in the ministry. He said, night and day, he did not cease to admonish each one with tears. In verse 34, he said that he ministered to the church by providing what? For his own needs. He works hard. Not only for his needs, but also for others' needs. He served with them, working with his own hands. It tells us a lot about of his sincerity, genuine desire to serve the Lord. Now, if a pastor is truly sincere, he wants to uh, warn his people. Look at verse, verses 28 to 30. Paul warns the elders. Verse 28. Let me read that to you again. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. Paul mentioned this danger. And there are two warnings that we see here. What is the first warning? He said, verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves. Who is the yourselves there? They are the overseers, right? He said there, uh, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. These are the shepherds. He, Paul is telling them, be on guard. So the first warning is to the faithful shepherds. Be on guard for yourselves. It is a call for self-examination. And you can also see that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16, when Paul said to Timothy, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. That's the same idea. Be on guard. Pay attention to yourself. And if you turn your Bibles quickly to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, very important, Paul said to Timothy, and keep one finger to Acts 20, we're going to go back there. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Paul said to Timothy, Flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness. There is a desire that a pastor needs to flee from. And what is that? Youthful lust. Youthful lust. That is a danger. That is a danger. This youthful lust or uh, youthful desire covers many things. It covers sinful um, desires that is mostly characteristics of young people. Like what? It involves sexual desire. It involves uh, craving for wealth, power, glory, selfish ambition, um, being self-assertive, 
argumentative, self-entitled, and all kinds of selfish desire. And Timothy is perhaps struggling with this. That's why Paul instructed him to flee youthful lust. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he said, Let no one look down on your youthfulness. Why is that? Because he's becoming timid. He's perhaps fearful of persecution. He's intimidated. He's apparently embarrassed by being a friend of Paul. That could be a reason, and that's part of what? Youthful lust, because that is pride. Becoming timid, shrinking back. And Paul said to Timothy, flee from that kind of desire. Flee from youthful lust. He probably is thinking about those things, thinking about uh, those desires, being self-assertive, thinking about power and glory. Paul said, that's dangerous. You need to flee. And this is a reminder to myself to pay close attention to myself, constant examination, daily fleeing from youthful desire. And so the first danger is for the faithful shepherd, like Timothy. And so Paul said to him, flee, be on guard, pay attention. Now the second danger, go back to Acts 20, verse 28. Let's look at the second warning. He said in verse 29, the second danger is from the wolves. He said, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And then he said in verse 30, And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. And these are the phony pastors who desire the office for selfish gain. They are wolves in sheep's clothing, men rising Perverse speaking things. Why? To draw away the church? And we can see a lot of those uh, false teachers in our culture today. True? False teacher who desires the office for selfish ambition. And we have a lot of that. I want to borrow a quote from an English reformer, Hugh Latimer. In his sermon, his sermon titled, The Sermon of the Plow. And in here, he talks about the hardworking, sincere, false teacher. Let me share that with you. He said, And now I would ask you a strange question. Who is the most diligent bishop in all England? that passes all the rest in doing his office? I can tell, for I know who it is. I know him well. But now I think I see you listening and hearkening that I should name him. There is one that passes all the other, and is the most diligent preacher in all England. And you know who it is. I will tell you, he said, he said, it is the devil. He is the most diligent preacher of all others. He is never out of his diocese. He is never away from his cure. You shall never find him unoccupied. He said, he is ever in his parish. He keeps residence at all times. You shall never find him out of the way Call for him when you will. He is ever at home. He is the most diligent preacher in all the realm. He is, he is ever at his plow. Nor lording or loitering can hinder him. He is ever applying his business. And then he said, he shall never find him idle. Close quote. False teachers works hard, Right? A lot of false churches work hard, very hard, diligent, consistent in most cases. 
better than us. True? You see, not all aspiration is true. Not all hard work is genuine. Many fake it till they make it. Judas covered his wickedness for three years, 20 years for others. Many famous preachers once were faithful, but now astray by the devil. Others believe the same, the same things as yours. They believe the same theology that we have, and then later on they, they're gone, astray. You see, we live in the world that is evil. The Bible said that the world lies in the lap of Satan, creating evil desires. And the main target is, is the church of Christ. And if you're faithful, you're the main target. I guess there are two sincere desires that we see in every church. Two sincere desires. One is from God, and the other is from whom? The devil. Both are sincere. First, sincerely righteous. Second is sincerely wicked. Both men work hard. Both aspire the office. And so how can we know the difference? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 7, very familiar text, Verses 15 to 20, Jesus said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And then he said, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he said, so then you, church, will know them by their fruits. And that's why in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Verses 2 to 7, Paul lays out the credentials of the overseer. And we will examine those next week, verses 2 to 7. In the meantime, that is the call of a spiritual leader. It is a serious call. What's the next? Specific call. A shepherding call. A sacrificial call in a sincere call. And we need to be reminded that those can be more of externalities. Meaning to say, sincerity is actually hard to uh, determine, right? And so we need to examine the pastor carefully it's not more of the work. Many are hardworking. Many are aspiring. Many have titles. Many have education. But what is the uh, only ordination question that Jesus had? He didn't say to Peter, uh, Peter, do you know this theology? Why did you deny me? Did, did you not know this and this and that? No, he only asked Peter, do you love me more than this? And just to encourage you, that's the one question that God wants you to have. Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation. The same church, chapter 2. Paul pastored the church of Ephesus 
for three years. Timothy, when Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy is pastoring the church in Ephesus. John pastored the church in Ephesus. And in chapter 2, we see here in the book of Revelation, to the angel, to the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands, say this, I know your deeds, mm, hard work, and your toil, and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. Very theological church. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance, and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. Hardworking church, very theological church. And then he said, but I have this against you, that you have left your what? First love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the, the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. That is the same question that the Lord is asking you, not only to the pastor, but to you. Do you love me more than this? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the love of Christ. We cannot produce this love. We love you because you first loved us. You poured your love to us through your spirit. You chose to love us in spite of us. And now we have this kind of love that is sincere. It is not perfect but it is sincere. Forgive us, Father, if we neglect, if we sometimes find ourselves enjoying youthful lust. We need to flee from that. Forgive us, O oh God, when we, we see ourselves in isolated sin. And so we ask, Father, that we need to be sincere in our calling through desires faithful desires help us father to be reminded of the danger that it could be coming from our church false teachers that will astray us we give you thanks we give you glory and honor in Christ's name amen